Welcome back to Apocalypse Here, everyone, for the second part of this interview with Stephen D. Morrison. In the first part of this interview, we talked about the great Swiss theologian Karl Barth for a little bit, and we also talked about the Scottish theologian T.F. Torrance. So if you haven't watched that video yet, um, and we also talked some about Stephen Morrison and who he is. Um, so if you haven't watched that part of the interview, you should go back and watch that first and then come back and watch this. So if you haven't paused this video, watch that and then come back and, and watch this one. Um, so in, in this video, we're gonna talk about um, three more key figures that Stephen has written about um, in his uh, Plain English series. Um, so the next one that we're gonna talk about is Jürgen Moltmann, someone who may not uh, you may not be as familiar with on my channel. I haven't really put out anything on Moltmann, so I'm excited to talk to you, to Stephen about about him. Um, so just to kind of begin with with Moltmann, um, can you kind of situate him biographically, kind of like you did before with the with Torrance and, and also Bart? Um, just give us a sense of kind of um, who he was and where he was situated, sort of contextually. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, well, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me back on. Uh, you bet. Uh, for part two. Um, Maltman is um, a German theologian. He uh, was born in 1926. He's still alive. He's 96 years old. He just turned 96 uh, in April. So um, he's, he's still up there. But um, he um, was born in an atheist family. And um, eventually, he wanted to go into physics. Uh, that was kind of his passion. And then World War II happened and he um, was uh, put into the German army. It was at, during that time where he had some of his first experiences of crying out to God. Um, one one story where he was on this landing and uh, his friend right next to him was blown away and he was saved. And he started to, for the first time, really question and, and feel like he was crying out to God for help. The first um, encounter he had with the British soldier, he uh, surrendered. Uh, to them, and then ended up being a prisoner of war for the rest of the time. Um, and it was in the POW camp in Scotland. Uh, he he moved around some, but, but particularly the one in Scotland, he spent the most time. Um, he read through the Bible, and he became a Christian. He began to kind of explore faith a little bit more. And uh, quite a moving story is when he was in the POW camp. He read through the, the scriptures, and when he got to uh, Christ's cry on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He came to realize this is someone who understands me. Uh, this is somebody who who my cry is is echoed, and he he was struck by that the fact that he had had a very similar cry after his um, friend was was blown apart right next to him. He said, "My God!" Uh, he cried out to God for the first time, and then obviously reading the Gospels, he his first impression was that uh, this is someone who understands uh, what he's been through. And so after World War II, he went and changed his mind from being going to physics and went into theology. He studied theology and eventually became a pastor uh, and then a professor. Uh, after after the fact, he, he did his PhD with uh, Otto Weber. And then um, he was a pastor and then his first book that kind of launched him into the, the um, spotlight was Theology of Hope, which came out in 1963. Then his, the, he had these first three books uh, that tried to re-examine the Christian faith from one specific perspective. So Theology of Hope was the first. Crucified God examined the cross uh, and the suffering of God. And then Church and the Power of the Spirit uh, was kind of a uh, work on the um, Holy Spirit and uh, the church. And then from that, he kind of launched into a theological career and uh, became a professor in Tübingen. And that's where he still lives today. He's still writing. He just published a book last year. Yeah. Uh, so he's 96 years old, has a doctoral student at the moment um, who I interviewed on my channel. Yeah, still doing doing great work. That's yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll put the link to that uh, that interview, which was great. Uh, it was awesome. And I, I was also really delighted to see that Moltmann had written the foreword for your volume on Moltmann. Yeah, it <laughs> which, was such an honor. Was, that, yeah. How cool is that, man? Like that's, yeah. <laughs> you got the guy himself. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was such yeah. an honor. I just kind of on a whim. He he doesn't do email or any of that. So I just said, yeah. had been corresponding through letters a few times and yeah, I was, I was blown away and it's a great forward too. Just really, really kind. Yeah, and, it is. Stuff, so it really is. You obviously mentioned the, the cry of dereliction um, on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that clearly sort of colors the way that, that 
Moltmann thinks theologically, um, and mm. especially in terms of his work, The Crucified God. That's a big and kind I, of I, striking part about his work is just the yeah. emphasis on the suffering of God, um, kind of that challenge against the doctrine of impassibility. Um, right. As well as right. many other innovations. I When I write about him in the book, I, I call him a theological iconoclast because I yeah. think he's just he's willing to question any of these things that we just take for granted uh, within theology. And he kind of comes to stuff somewhat as that outsider. Like I mentioned, his background being an atheist that kind of went through the fires of World War Two to become the theologian he was uh, and still is. It's a big motif of his work for sure is to, to challenge the status quo. And um, yeah, and that's that's one of the big areas is in the suffering of God. And I, I imagine that, you know, people who have not sort of been introduced to theology that's talking about God's suffering or sort mm -hmm. of come to theology with the assumption that, you know, of course, God doesn't suffer. God is so far kind of removed from anything like human suffering or, or anything like that. But in The Crucified God, Moltmann kind of tackles this head on. And I, I, I would like uh, very much if you would kind of walk through a little bit of what Moltmann does in that work, The Crucified God, and how he kind of approaches this stuff in that book. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. He, um, It's one of the things that drew me to his theology at first was this question of the suffering of God, um, you know, because classically that's just such a central question within theology is where was God in the midst of suffering, um, yeah. the theodicy question, and, and all the kind of philosophical connotations that come with that. Um, but yeah, so for Maltman, I think the way that I've I've um, introduced to it in the book is that um, traditional philosophical notions of God's relation to suffering, um, a lot of them derive from Plato and his work yeah. on God's inability to to be suffered, impassibility, the inability of God to be moved by suffering, and so it, it's um it, it's rooted in kind of this concept where uh, your uh, doctrine of God is normative for what God does and Maltman kind of following Bart's insight he kind of follows Bart's actualism where um, there's no God behind the back of Jesus Christ and so what it is for God to actually be God is known only through God's acts uh, and uh, where God has revealed God's self and so Maltman takes that insight and applies it to the cross and um, so for Maltman he reverses that formula where no longer is our doctrine of God, uh, philosophically, speculatively established, is normative for the cross, where we interpret the cross on the basis of the doctrine of God, right. but rather the cross becomes normative for the doctrine of God, where the question then becomes, can God suffer? It's The answer is, well, the cross, God did suffer, and he, he did suffer on the cross, and so that God has to be able to suffer within God's self. And so it's on, it's on this... Uh, yeah, it takes this the actualism of uh, Bart and applies it to the cross. And it, there's a lot more innovative uh, concepts within it, especially with the Trinity. It's following Bart's insight, kind of that anti-speculation uh, motif within Bart. Uh, we, we cannot project kind of our speculations up into the heavens and call it God uh, and then define Jesus in the light of those philosophical and speculative concepts, um, but rather define God according to how God defines God's self. Um, and for Maltman, that is the cross and the suffering of God, um, where uh, Christ reaches into the pit of our suffering and suffers with us. It's very challenging idea to reflect on, um, but at once ex I find it extremely pastoral. I think for Maltman's work, it's really comforting for um, for us that you know live on Earth and experience suffering every day and, and have to echo that very same cry my god why have yeah. you forsaken me and um the ability to answer that question um maltman's careful he, to to stress that he's not trying to have some sort of a answer to theodicy he he leaves that as something that's still open-ended right but ultimately it's this sense of solidarity where uh, god in christ is with us maltman yeah very much critiques the idea that god cannot suffer and so he's this great line that a god who cannot suffer in the midst of these these atrocities such as the holocaust or um, other other atrocities is is an inhuman a demonic god um, mm -hmm. and so he's he's quite strong in that regard but it really is rooted in that top down or bottom up approach but in that sense of whether or not we begin with the speculative god and then use that god to force the cross to be something else or we just let the cross be normative for who god is and so Moulton's great line about 
this is who God is on the cross as is who God has revealed God's self to be. Really great summary of, of Moltmann on that topic. And what is our starting point when we're talking about God? I think that's the mm-hmm. key question that people who are reading Bart carefully after yeah. Bart are really kind of latching on to and taking in, in really interesting and also constructive directions. Because if it's the case that certain substance metaphysics are controlling what we mean when we talk about Jesus, we're already starting off on the wrong foot. And I think Moman is careful to be like, no, we start with Jesus, where God has actually chosen to disclose who he is to us. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we, we get a sense of who God really is. So I think somebody like Moltmann is a good example of where um, the importance of starting points for theological thinking really, yeah. really matters. And re- the rubber really hits the road for him. Yeah. Obviously, there are so many different things we could talk about. We could get into, the, you know, his theology of hope, which is wonderful. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the way of Jesus Christ. Um, we could mm-hmm. go all sorts of directions. But I, I you brought up something that I, I think would be really cool to talk about which is Moltmann's kind of universalism and how that kind of contrasts with some of his forebears specifically mm-hmm. somebody like like Karl Barth um, mm-hmm. which I've talked about before and I know you you have a great video on Barton universalism so how how does Moltmann approach the question of universal salvation Moltmann goes a little bit further than Bart in this. Um, Bart was a bit hesitant to affirm universalism uh, for his own reasons. But I think Maltman moves into, a, a, I, I tend to refer to him somewhat as a soft universalist, which it maybe isn't a term he would accept himself. But um, the reason why is because he presupposes it as a conclusion of his theology of the cross. Mm-hmm. That in the end, God will be all in all and uh, that hell um, will be empty. And uh, he does, he has this great interview where he does say that I believe in hell, but as a Christian, I can only say that there's one person who goes to hell and that's Jesus Christ. And um, I think it's just a beautiful approach to it. So he, he has an emphasis on both the cross and on Holy Saturday, uh, which is neglected so much in the church. His presupposition is that uh, in the end, God will be all in all and that nothing and no one will be lost. I found the quote because it's one of my favorite things he's ever written. So I, I'm going to read it. It's um, yeah, please do from his uh, The Coming of God. He's citing um, Christoph Blumhard for this, um, who's a, another kind of precursor to his theology of hope and, and really great person to check out because he influenced Bart a lot as well. So he says this, the confession of hope has completely slipped through the church's fingers. There can be no question of God's giving up anything or anyone in the whole world, either today or in eternity. The end has to be, behold, everything is God's. Jesus comes as the one who has borne the sins of the world. Jesus can judge but not condemn. My desire is mm. to have preached this as far as the lowest circles of circles of hell, and I will never be confounded. That's kind of the, the strong yes that Maltman says to uh, universalism. Now, I, I kind of tend to soften it because I think it's accurate. I, I like his approach to kind of pulling back a little bit he theologically affirms that in the end god will be all in all and the reason he does it is like i said it's a presupposition of the cross but it's also for maltman a sense of um an eschatology of of god that in the end god will not be true to god's self as creator if anyone is lost and so that's his strong yes but i do kind of appreciate his i guess it's not even really a no but more of kind of an honest uh, reflection that he has about universalism where he says towards the end of Jesus Christ for today's world that um, if I examine myself seriously, I'm not sure if, if I'm a universalist, kind of paraphrasing it. And I think the honesty with that is the fact that really one of the great challenges um, for universalism isn't that it's too, you know, ear itching. It's actually hard for us to get our heads around the idea that in the end, all will be reconciled to God because that's part of the struggle we have as, you know, as Christians, we want retribution. We, that's, that's our sinful nature to want our pound of flesh. We want the evil people to suffer, but that's our sinfulness and not our grace and not, and not the grace. And so it's realizing that God's grace is always going to be a challenge for us, not something that we just slip into. I think mm. that's something that evangelicals get wrong is they assume that if it's good, if it sounds like too good of news, it's going to be that itch, itch in ear message when it's actually the yeah, opposite. Yeah. 
where our nature is to bash people and to mm. want want to you know do violence to people so i appreciate that honesty where i think i could say the same if i examine myself honestly there's people that i would like to see go to hell just mm. just to be yeah. honest like that's yeah, there's yeah. so much evil and injustice in the world mm -hmm. you know i you think of the tyrants and the oppressors of 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 thousands if not millions of people you know that slaughter innocent people i mean obviously the name that comes up all the time is like hitler it's like do i really want him to be saved I, I think if i examine myself honestly probably no but that's where universalism stretches us to be more kind and more gracious than i think we're inclined to be and so i appreciate maltman's approach to that that's the only thing i kind of say that softens it a little bit and kind of contextualizes it so um but then he does go around and he says i don't think i am but god right. I'm one. yeah 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 and yeah. so he he flips that around and and says that ultimately it's he, he's doing the Bardian kind of jive there. Ultimately, it's a question that God will answer. Um, but he does suspect that and have very good theological foundation for saying that, yes, uh, all will be saved um, in the end if God is true to God's self. It's a long explanation, but I think understanding the nuance of how he approaches it is important because it's easy just to be like very black and white with this issue. I, I think especially coming from more of that evangelical background, you kind of want just an easy like yes or no answer for stuff. But I think sometimes it's the nuance is really the the thing that differentiates um, a good theologian and a bad one. And, and so being able to kind of distinguish it is important. And really, I, I think another beautiful aspect of it is Maltman's emphasis on the victims of history. Um, he always stressed that um, it's the crucified people of history that are going to cry out for justice. And if their voice is not uh, heard and if justice is not done to them, then God is not true to who God revealed God's self to be in Jesus Christ. And so that that sense of the poor and the weak of history that, you know, the, the millions, if not billions of countless victims of injustice, of yeah. um, war, of death, of whatever, that if death has the final word and not God, then God's not true to who God is as creator and as savior in Christ. And so the aspect's quite beautiful as well. You put it really well in terms of the kind of reversal that somebody like Moltmann makes. Mm -hmm. I think Bart kind of does it too in mm -hmm. a certain way, which is what's hard for us is actually understanding that that's a reality <laughs> because we want to sort of lapse mm -hmm. back into certain ways of thinking about like what we think is just and good which would yeah. be, you know, punishing people who do horrible things, who mm -hmm. harm and damage. It seems natural to us, but I think it, yeah. in reality, it's us sort of lapsing into, as Paul would put it, a kind of fleshly way yeah. of thinking about things, right? For sure. Uh, but it seems so, you know, natural. Um, yeah. Um, whereas, like, the, the, yeah. the sort of, you know, evangelical critique of something like universalism, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, a hard universalism or a soft one, is yeah. that, oh, that's just easy. What's yeah. really hard is like, you know, believing that God's going to kill some people. <laughs> yeah. You know? Um, yeah. But like, when you step back and think about it, yeah, of course, the most kind of natural way that we think about things is this sort of hard, mm -hmm. retributive kind of way. Yeah. Um, and it, it's hard to be confronted by the reality of grace. Yeah. That, that really calls us into question mm -hmm. and what we are committed to into question. That's what's hard when we see that sort of unconditionality because we we don't there's something in us that doesn't want to kind of take yeah. that on board but, yeah no for sure it, um it, it i'm reminded of the um quote that bart says i think it's one of my favorite things he says where he um i pulled it up because it's it's so good he he talks about it in um his little book the humanity of god yeah. um, but he has this great line towards the end of it where he's talking about his openness to universalism and um he and he says this he says our theological duty is to see and understand it as being still greater than when he had, than we had seen it before. And he's talking about the loving kindness of God. Um, I'll go back a little bit. He says, there's no theological right to set any sort of limit to the loving kindness of God, which has appeared in Christ. Our theological duty is to see and understand it as being still greater than we had seen it before. And so kind of on that theme of it being the stretching point isn't towards being more sadistic to, towards people the stretching point is to be more loving kind towards people yeah. and to see that way the next figure that we're going to talk about uh you yep. wrote about him in 2019 i believe yep uh it's friedrich schleiermacher um friedrich schleiermacher 
someone again who probably not familiar with on my channel because i haven't <laughs> slayer monk is hard like he's a difficult mm -hmm. figure to, to kind of grasp what he's doing and i've always found him difficult to kind of pin down mm -hmm. um i am pretty familiar with him um but he's he's pretty misunderstood i think um mm -hmm. or um intentionally mischaracterized he kind of reminds me of of somebody like like hegel actually um mm. Who the content of his thinking kind of gets mischaracterized and misunderstood. I mean, because Hegel's yeah. so hard to get. Um, yeah. So he gets reduced to like this scheme of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, which Hegel never sells. He never says himself. Yeah. Yeah. But he sort of gets pinned down in this kind of way. Yeah. Um, I, I think we, we have that tendency as just humans. We want to simplify. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, when you're talking about such a complex thinker as Hegel or even Schleiermacher, I interesting yeah. enough, they both taught. Uh, at University of uh, Berlin at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And Schleiermacher didn't like Hegel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he would uh, <laughs> put his lectures at the same time so that his students had to choose between him or Yeah, it's an either or. Hegel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, but e even in terms of like the the structure of of what Schleiermacher does in mm -hmm. um, his dogmatics is difficult to grasp too. Yeah. Um, and which actually kind of reminds me of calvin a bit mm -hmm. um that the back end of calvin is actually kind of where things kind of become clearer where he starts talking about yeah. participation he starts talking about sort of the role of the holy spirit yep. in sort of engrafting people into into christ yeah, and that's by, that's by design schleiermacher modeled yeah. his christian faith off of um uh, the institutes yeah. people criticize schleiermacher for stuff that they praise calvin for um and then, calvin begins with yeah. the experience to some extent <laughs> He does, yeah, exactly. And moves right. towards the yeah, like you said, it kind of went backwards. And Schleiermacher does very similar thing. Uh, um, I so I think Schleiermacher is slightly more scientific in just his rigorousness. So maybe he gets mis misunderstood in that for sure. Regard. And I, but, I, I think um, that's due to sort of the the education that was so important to Schleiermacher. Having yeah. you know, he, he was so influenced by certain Enlightenment figures, yeah, in important ways. Mm -hmm. um, that it's no wonder that he was really sort of um i don't want to say he's more precise than calvin because calvin is also very very precise i mean yeah. he's he was a lawyer um mm -hmm. so yeah um but yeah i think you're exactly right about that uh before we get into some of the content of sure. of schleiermacher's thinking um once again can you kind of situate schleiermacher for us biographically yeah. a little bit I, I love Schleiermacher. Schleiermacher. I um I feel like a little bit like Bart sometimes, where I I never feel like I'm done with him. Um, yeah. Bart wrestled, uh, unlike Emil Brunner, who burned all of his Schleiermacher texts after writing his work on Schleiermacher. Bart wrestled with Schleiermacher his entire life, and and so I feel the same. I think he's somebody that I continually want to return to, um, and and all that. But. But yeah, to give some context for him. So he's the oldest theologian I've done in terms of um, he's from the 18th. He was born in the 18th century. So 1768 is when he was born. And then he died February uh, 1834. He's often called the father of modern theology, sometimes the father of modern liberal theology. Um, I just prefer to call him father of modern theology. Um, the plain English series is kind of focused on modern theologians. So he's kind of the earliest figure I think I'll do. Um but his father was a reformed pastor. He um, went and studied with the Moravians, which I always think is quite interesting, yeah. given my kind of charismatic background. Um, he kind of went to school with the, the Moravians. Um, and during that time, he had a crisis of faith as he began to kind of read the romantic, uh, German romantics, uh, the Enlightenment thinkers, Goethe, Goethe um, Kant, and people like that were kind of the big figures early on that started to kind of challenge his naive uh, acceptance of faith. And so it's kind of a misconception that he lost his faith. I don't think he did. He just lost his his um, inherited version of faith, which I think is pretty accurate to many people that grew up in the church. That's something I related to. I think sure. I could quite easily say I don't believe in the same God I used to. Um, I'm an atheist in that sense to the God mm -hmm. that was taught to me in Sunday school uh, totally. And so that that's i think something that tracks well with with schleiermacher he was a hospital chaplain and tutor for a period of time and then in night or in 1799 he wrote his uh kind of big book on religion 
his first of many great works. It kind of threw down a challenge to the cultural uh, culture despisers of religion is the subtitle to it, where he was basically defending religion. Um, yeah. And so he that's where he has the, the phrase where uh, religion is the uh, sense and taste of the infinite um, and all these other kind of romantic inspired uh, phrases um they come from that and so that was his first great book and then um he uh, taught as a professor in 1904 to 1910 and then 1910 he was in uh berlin where he stayed for the rest of the time um then in uh 1821 he publishes christian faith which is his great dogmatic work uh second edition came out in uh um 1830 and 31 and so i, I with all of that said i think in the the way I tend to think about Schleiermacher and his significance is really being the very first uh, thorough response to the Enlightenment and to modernity. That's why he's called the father of modern theology, and I think for good reason, because I think before that, um, many theologians and Christians were merely reacting to moder modernity, which I think they're still reacting to modernity. Um, you could make a case for evangelicalism being a very much just a reaction, kind of the knee jerk reaction against science, against um, modern ways of thinking. And so he constructed an actual response to modernity um, that actually tries to um, speak the Christian faith to the enlightenment time, to this time of, um, of modern thinking and modern approach to science, to to faith and, and all these things. And so he is sometimes for that reason called the father of modern uh, liberal theology, which I, I don't like that term just because I think um, liberal and conservative, it just depends on where you stand. Like if you're super far right, everybody's liberal to you. If you're yeah. super far, you know, it's 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 just a relevant relative term. So I don't think it's terribly yeah. accurate. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, anyways, uh, during his own lifetime, he was mostly known as a pastor. He was very loved as a pastor in Berlin. An interesting kind of fact about to show just how much of an impact he made in his community um, at his funeral. Uh, some accounts give various figures, but some of the numbers that are given is about 20,000 people attended his funeral in the city of Berlin. And so it was a virtual mm. day of mourning for the entire city when he died. Um and so his preaching and his sermons had a profound impact. He was a very diligent and delicate and dedicated student of scripture. He gave the very first public lectures on the life of Jesus, um, predating some of the uh, quest for the new Jesus movements. Uh, he kind of pioneered the higher critical critical approach to the scriptures, um, and, and through his commentary on Luke. Um, he did some philosophy. He focused on ethics, um, which is an important part of his work as well. Um, he actually tried to plan and tried to write a um, second second uh, volume to or a second part to Christian faith, which would be Christian ethics, which would have been in equal measure as significant as Christian faith if he would have completed it. Um, we have some of his notes and they, they indicate that it would have been basically placing ethics on the same status of uh, dogmatics, which is something Bart did as well, um, that every theological uh, insight has to have that ethical component as well. And so not to mention uh, his work in hermeneutics, um, like I said, his, his understanding of faith and science, um, and then his great dogmatics. And so his contribution is really enormous. He, you can't, um, you can keep pulling the threads and keep finding so many areas of thought where Schleiermacher has his fingerprints on it. Either he was the first or he did it the best or something of that sort. And so, yeah, he's a he's a really significant theologian, um, somebody that is extremely misunderstood, partially due to some of the kind of Bart Bartian knee jerk reaction, uh, which I think Bart would be unhappy with. Um, I kind of read yep. Schleiermacher myself because of Bart's love for him um, mm -hmm. in Bart's home in Basel. He had a portrait of Bart or uh, sorry, <laughs> he had a portrait of himself. No, no, yeah. he had a portrait of Schleiermacher <laughs> on the wall. Uh, and so he he really admired Schleiermacher. Yeah, and um, he did. So that was my first approach to him was kind of through Bart. But then I as I really studied Schleiermacher for his own sake, I realized just how significant he is. And I think a theologian that. He's kind of having a moment in Germany um, from from what I've understood. So he's now the most uh, popular theologian to do a dissertation on in Germany. Um, so he's kind of 
having his own renaissance over there. So I'm hoping that in English speaking circles that uh, Schleiermacher will be given another chance. It's interesting how he describes the task of dogmatics. Um, mm -hmm. He really does attach it to experience, which is, you know, people can take that and sort of run with it in a way that it's, it's all about sort of subjectivity. It's all about mm -hmm. feelings. <laughs> it's not mm -hmm. really about anything external, which I think people kind of have done with him unfairly mm -hmm. um especially with the, anytime you hear schleiermacher you're going to hear something like feeling of absolute dependence or yeah. the alternative translation absolute feeling of dependence something like mm -hmm. that that's going to sort of be paired with what schleiermacher does mm -hmm. um, and i think he gets reduced to a kind of unfair reading of what that signals in terms mm -hmm. of subjectivity um yeah. and sort of internal experiential stuff right um can you kind of address that um especially to do with that that phrase feeling of mm -hmm. of absolute dependence yeah and then kind of segue into how that relates to what he, he does sort of dogmatically um mm -hmm. and also how that's how that's situated specific because i think the context mm -hmm. in which that phrase comes up and mm -hmm. where that phrase sort of like unpacks um the context really matters for that it's very common um i was even just recently on wikipedia never great like it's hit or miss uh somebody there was some comment about schleiermacher how he makes the christian faith totally subjective um like oh I should go edit that, but I don't think I know even how. But, um, but that's it's the not common worth one. Your time. It, <laughs> yeah, probably not. Um, the, but that's the common one: is that Schleiermacher yeah. turned the Christian faith into a wholly subjective experience, where it's just this feeling. Uh, it's just some sort of a almost mystical. That was Brunner's phrase about it. That it's a mystical theology. But I, I think it's really unfortunate um because yeah um schleiermacher really isn't doing anything different than anselm's phrase faith seeking understanding first yeah. there is the experience of faith that yes. then seeks understanding exactly and he actually begins yeah. his dogmatics with that quote and yeah. so that should have clued us off a little bit um but there's a lot more that goes into it i think for me i the thing that i typically respond to that kind of subjectivist uh interpretation of schleiermacher is First of all, that Schleiermacher was a reformed theologian who who central who was very central to his theology was the doctrine of grace and particularly election and God's action towards us in um, in in grace. And so I actually began my book with Schleiermacher's doctrine of election just because I wanted to stress God's activity towards the human human being as being central for Schleiermacher. And not not only that, but because his doctrine of election is uh, extremely fascinating. I think it's um, it. it I think B.A. Garish or somebody called it the great innovation after Bar after Calvin and before Bart. So essentially, if, if you trace kind of the development of the doctrine of election, really Calvin didn't do much besides um, Augustine. And and so Schleiermacher kind of was one of the first innovators in that doctrine and um, influenced Bart, I, I suspect, uh, to a good degree. There's several good books on that topic. But um but anyways, I start there because I wanted to stress that uh, Schleiermacher is a theologian of grace. The, the, the now infamous phrase, feeling of absolute dependence, has to be contextualized into the act of God towards human beings. And so ultimately, that phrase in itself, yeah. if you actually sit and unpack it, tells you that. But I think people get caught off guard by the feeling, the fact that the word feelings in there. Um, but is he contrasts it with feeling of relative dependence, which is the relation of the human being to other creatures within the world and the creaturely uh, sphere itself. And so that is the day to day experience we have with uh, other people, our lives with them where we need them relatively. And so the absolute dependence is the indication that we live and move and have our being because of God because of what mm -hmm. God has done and because because of God. And so in, in a sense, what Tillich later called the ground of being is something that kind of Schleiermacher is predating here. The important part for the feeling of absolute dependence is uh, to realize it as something that originates in God, not in the human subject. Um, it, it is something that we are passive in that role. We are absolutely dependent upon the God who acts. Yeah. Um, and he says not, that explicitly. <laughs> yeah, absolutely does. Um, it makes it, he does make it really clear yeah. 
yeah. um, throughout. <laughs> but like we've said, it's it's easy to mischaracterize these guys and, and yeah. smooth over, over the nuance. Um, yeah. But that's the first thing I usually say to that. The second is that, um, like you kind of hinted towards, he places it very specifically within his dogmatics. Yeah. He considered the the uh, introduction in part one kind of an entrance way into the proper dogmatics. Um, it's kind of a boundary hall and entrance way. It's kind of the precursor, the the earlier stuff that gets kind of uh, more and more narrow as you keep going and more and more specific. And so he kind of wrote the dogmatics backwards or the most substantial, the heaviest, the, the stuff that has the heaviest weight for him theologically comes at the end. Um, and so his theology is really Christocentric, Christomorphic, uh, to be more specific, where Christ the Redeemer is the center of his uh, concept of God, his, his faith, uh, and, and what it is to do dogmatics is rooted in who Christ is as the Redeemer. And really the high point of the dogmatics is kind of the final sections where he talks about God as love and God, God's wisdom or is like kind of the section I tend to point people to is like, if you want to know the very heart of Schleiermacher's uh, Christian faith, go to that and then maybe read the Christological sections. But really that's the, he even calls it a capstone or keystone, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity mm -hmm. that he concludes with probably the best translation of the phrase is keystone. It's the key that kind of connects the entire work together. And so Shelley Poe has this great book where she talks about Schleiermacher's essential Trinitarianism, where she tries to disprove the notion that the Trinity was just an afterthought. For yeah, Kant, that's right. true. You know, for his, his it, it is, yeah. philosophy, yeah, it was yeah. non-essential. It didn't matter. For sure. Schleiermacher, it's absolutely not true. And so she does right. an excellent job of tracing backwards the the influence of the Trinity of the doctrine of God back into uh, the Christian faith. So I highly recommend that. Um, and I, I talked about it some in my book as well. But um, so I tend to tell people that um, the Christian faith as a um, as a volume, you have to read it twice. It's kind of impossible not to. So that's a lot to stomach of like a several thousand page book to be like, yeah, you just read it twice or else you don't get it. <laughs> but he wrote it in such a tightly constructed way that you kind of can't avoid it. Um, that's kind of his genius, but it's kind of his flaw as well. Towards the end of my book, I recommend a few different ways to read uh, Christian faith. Um, the first one is actually beginning backwards with part two. So the book has four parts, introduction, part one, part two, and then the conclusion. So beginning backwards with part two, specifically paying attention to the sections on God is love and wisdom, uh, and then work backwards to the introduction and part one, where he's kind of doing the less essential work. He's not building the foundation in, in the introduction. I think that's the misunderstanding. The foundation yeah, for the whole not. work comes after. Yeah, that's that's a lot of the misunderstanding. There's a lot more um, stuff, a lot more that can be said about the actual phrase and how he uses it. But it is very misunderstood. And I think it causes people to not read Schleiermacher. And, and unfortunately, they're missing out on a really rich and rewarding experience in theology. I, I think it's it has to be the greatest theological systematic theology I've read, maybe next to Bart's, maybe even better. I mean, it's hard to say Bart's is so long that it's it's it could be shorter. But but I, I actually <laughs> wouldn't have a single page less for Bart. But um, <laughs> no, it's it. It's it's a really profound theological journey to go through it and really study it well. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I mean, it, your point about the, the sort of introduction, I think, is really key because he, mm -hmm. he sort of stacks a bunch of prefatory comments and, and sections, mm -hmm. really, um, that are really just for the purpose of situating what he's wanting to do theologically in yeah. the sort of broader understanding of academic disciplines, right? Yeah. A lot of yeah, a lot possibly. of that is that's that's sort of what he's doing. So he's not actually mm -hmm. setting the stage precisely yeah. for his own thinking. Yeah, um, he's actually yeah. doing this more sort of let's sort of uh, mm -hmm. get a sense of the field of scholarship at the moment and and sort of situate yeah. what I'm doing within that. His great little book on the Globenschleier on the doctrine of faith. It's mm -hmm. essential reading for if you want to understand Christian faith, it's he recommended, he said, people don't understand the Christian faith. They so these issues were something he dealt with in his own time as well. You can almost think of it as a bit of a crescendo. It starts off kind of yeah small. And then it, it's, it's really the end that is the heart of the whole thing. Yeah. The, the other thing that came to mind for me when you mentioned Kant, who was obviously important for, for Schleiermacher was, mm -hmm. I do think that there is a tendency to over determine Kant in 
Schleiermacher to such mm-hmm. an extent that he's basically just doing what Kant does. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Just in a slightly different way. And I, I, I don't think that's, that's quite right. Kant mm-hmm. is important, but Kant mm-hmm. isn't sort of determining what he's doing. Kant's useful for him, but he's not kind of the end all and all be all, yeah. especially not to do with sort of um, sub- subjectivism and, and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. I mean, I think any philosophical influence for any theological figure can always, always has to be bracketed within some sort of a um, framework. Cause you could say the same about Bart. Maybe you could try to make the case if he was a Kantian or, you know, whatever. And, uh, or Maltman being a Hegelian or, you know, so it's like, Mm -hmm. there's traces of that and they certainly borrow from it, but they're doing something totally different. All right. So then the next plain English figure, um, that you wrote about in 2020 is James Cone. James Mm -hmm. Cone is really known as the kind of father of black liberation theology. Mm -hmm. Um, His name has come up recently in, unfortunately in relation to a lot of the CRT uh, (laughs) discussions (laughs) in quite unhelpful, quite unhelpful ways, but um, to kind of, before we actually get into sort of what Cone um, thought about theology, thought about about God, mm-hmm. thought about the gospel, can you give us some just some biographical information about who he was? For sure. Um, so yeah, James Cone, American theologian, who was born in Arkansas um, in 1938. Um, he um, attained his PhD and um, kind of immediately became disillusioned with the white theological institutions, and so yeah, he he began to develop. He, after all of his schooling, he obviously went through the European theology. His PhD was on uh, Bart, I think his Doctrine of Man, um, and all of that. And so he struggled to reconcile the education that he had as a theologian. Um, I believe, I, I should have looked this up, but I believe he was the first uh, black man to graduate with a PhD from the school that he went to. Um so he he went through all of this. He he had attained his PhD um, and kind of became disillusioned with the white theological structures um, because he felt like they had really nothing to say to him as a black man living in America, um, kind of through the black power movement, through the uh, civil rights movement, um, were kind of the mo- the big momentous um, occasions for his life. Obviously, a big transition and change within America itself. Um, but he grew up in the South, was quite familiar with like you know, obviously the structures of white supremacy, but then the kind of casual racism that would come into it. Um, but he found his um, church to be such a strength and a source of spiritual um, comfort and also resistance against that um, and of and of black dignity uh, for him as well. And so all of this kind of combined to um, his feeling the need to develop a theology of liberation uh, for the black community within America um, he was really inspired to develop this almost a parallel theology to the Black Power movement that was taking place during his time, um, sort right. of that uh, approach. And so his first his first move into this uh, Black Power and Black theology um, is kind of the the best introduction to the, what he was beginning to do and kind of his his movement through it. And um, and so yeah, he began to challenge some of the white theological uh, assumptions about how to do theology. And um, he has this great phrase that just is kind of a good gut punch. But um, every time I read it, it's really impressive where he says that I refuse to let my theological concerns be determined by the people who had enslaved my grandparents. That's horrifying. And in the way that Christianity had been used within America, especially in the South, to justify uh, slavery, justify Jim Crow era, and obviously through the... Um, civil rights era to justify hatred towards Martin Luther King um, as well as Malcolm X. And so those two figures were big and important for him, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. He kind of held them dialectically together um, in his own work as well as through uh, the black power movement. And so, so yeah, he started to develop a black liberation theology for his community um, that spoke the uh, gospel to his particular context and time, uh, particularly the political environment and social environment that he was in. He published black theology and black power in 1969. So right towards, uh, you know, the heart of some of these issues, a theology of liberation, uh, 1970, and then God of the oppressed in 1975, which I think of as his um, really great systematic work 
Um, and then he uh, passed away in, in 2018. He taught at Union Seminary for a uh, number of years. Since he spoke English, you can check out his YouTube, uh, not YouTube, but a ton of his lectures are on YouTube. So he's he's a great person to to check out. Yeah. Um, for me, personally, as the first American theologian I did in the series, I um, personally consider him to be the most significant American theologian because he actually challenged the um, structures of America's greatest sin being racism um, and you could probably combine greed with that that's kind of a empty game that people play of who's the greatest american theologian but i think it's a shame to put people like um charles hodge or or, or even uh, other people that had been complicit or had directly owned slaves in their lifetime uh when that is such a original sin of america and so james Cone's the first uh to confront confront that head on and to offer a theological challenge to it. Um, and so that's kind of his life and context. He was rooted in the black community and, and trained as a theologian and then found his way to become the uh, most hated theologian in America. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> pretty much. Um, yeah. Pre uh, pretty much. I, I was fortunate enough um, back in 2015 to be present at his MLK lectures at, at Duke Divinity. Oh, wow. Um, That's great. Which was, I, it, it was one of the best, you know, experiences theologically that I've ever had was seeing him, him speak mm. and go through chronologically each one of his works <laughs> um, mm. and explain sort of what he was thinking and doing as he was writing yeah. them. And he just went step by step through it. And yeah. it, it was a real gift to be able to, to just be there and watch him do it. And that th there's a video of it, I think, on Duke's YouTube mm. channel. Um, so for those of you who kind of want to see him um, more recently before he passed, um, kind of mm -hmm. do a retrospective. That's a that's a really, really cool place to go. As far as uh, Cohn's approach to theology, you mentioned sort of mm -hmm. white theology and sort of whiteness. Um, and something that I learned from a couple of my teachers at Duke, especially Willie Jennings, J. Cameron Carter, mm -hmm. um, is that whiteness sort of imposes a kind of universality on, and kind of a, a monopoly on on what mm -hmm. theology should be and is. And it's quite, mm -hmm. um, it's colonizing, obviously, and it's also quite abstract. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And it's, it's sort of, lifts above all contexts and peoples and land and geography and mm -hmm. all kind of contingency. There are ways in which all of us kind of can lapse into that kind of stuff because it's all around us. It's in the, the air we breathe as Christians mm -hmm. um, to kind of feel elevated above any sort of contextual and situational dynamics. Mm -hmm. Something that Cone, um, I think, does really well is, is pay attention to to context and to situations and to um, mm -hmm. to understanding that, that theology is only ever sort of arising out of, out of those mm -hmm. things. Can you, because um, that, that's so important for Cone, can you kind of walk us through how Cone kind of um, unpacks that in his own own theology? Yeah, yeah. no, for, for sure. For Cone, um, kind of like you're saying, the idea that we can do, we can, write a theology that is valid for all people, all time, all cultures is just a faulty assumption. Um, and it's, and it's frankly wrong. And so um, he really stresses the contextual aspect of all theology, um, that all theology, whether it admits it or not is contextual. And so even the white theology that claims that universal abstract mm -hmm. uh, objective approach that, this is the absolute truth. And that is in itself contextual, even if it tries to mask it or hide it. And that's some of the um, danger of, of that sort of language is that it acts as if, if you go against this theology, it it's, you're going against the truth and you're, you know, that's sort of the dogmatism that sets in for white theology. Um, but even Cohn's use of those two terms, white theology, black theology is meant to, refocus theology into the contextual uh, environment that it comes from. While, of course, um, you know, we believe that God is, you know, the truth and, and, and all these things, and we believe that there is truth. God doesn't write theology. We do as human beings. And so we're always going to be striving towards something that is incomplete. 
I always like Maltman's metaphor about that, that we're always on the way, that we're never having this complete uh, theology, that it's always an open-ended work. The contextual aspect of theology is central for Cone, um, in, especially within that context, where he challenges the idea that white theology is just normative, it's um, universal, uh, it doesn't have to speak, speak to any specific context or community, it can just be general and work for everybody, uh, where Cohn challenges that um, explicitly with his development of a black theology of liberation, a, a, liber a theology that has its own sources in the black community that's rooted in the black experience within America, um, the history of the black experience within America, that's rooted in the spirituals and the blues uh, that's rooted in the struggle. Uh, he has that gr a great lecture about the cry of black blood. Um, mm -hmm. That's quite a beautiful uh, aspect. And so the contextual dimension of it's super important where it challenges that faulty assumption um, that theology can just be universal in general, uh, that it has to have a specific context. Um, and really that's the aspect of preaching the gospel anew to each time and each context that gets ignored with some of this abstract and absolutizing theology um and so yeah he he stressed the contextual aspect of it and then specifically with the theology of liberation he stressed that in the scriptures there is a particular context as well where christ and god takes sides with the poor and the weak um against the empire against uh the rich often in the scriptures and against the powerful and the oppressors and so like luke 4 talking about letting the oppressed go free and then Mary's Magnificat that's so overlooked, I think, but such a, I mean, remarkable uh, statement that the the high will be brought low and the rich will be left empty and the poor will go away with good gifts. And so the, that sort of element that not only all theology is contextual, but a proper theological interpretation of history and of events is that God takes sides with the poor and the oppressed. And so a theology that's developed from this empty abstraction uh, helps really no one. Because mm -hmm. if it's accepting of the status quo, if it merely refuses to challenge the power structures of society, then it is complicit in those same structures. And so a big part of Cohn's critique against white theology is that it is the theology that uh, was silent to the black blood that was crying out uh, during slavery, during colonization, uh, during Jim Crow, and even today in the criminal justice system and yeah. all the other systemic issues that are, are taking place. And so... That sort of just complicity of, oh, we don't have to speak about race is, I think, one of the biggest ones where the gospel is, gospel is colorless. God doesn't see color. I think the best response to that is if God doesn't see color, then God doesn't see injustice. And therefore, God cannot be the God of justice uh, who is concerned with the least of these. I think all of those things kind of come up with with him of why he sought to develop a black liberation theology. But um, really, that's the beginning point I, I tend to recommend for people is that Cohn is stressing that all theology is contextual. And uh, that's why he's developing it in the way that he is. You were sort of alluding to th throughout what you were saying um, that connects very clearly to his contextual kind of um, approach to theology is, is um, the blackness of God and how that connects sort of historically to Judaism and in, in mm -hmm. Israel um, and God's relationship with Israel. Um, can you talk a little bit about that connection a bit more? Uh, it'll move quite cleanly into how Cohn thinks about the gospel in terms of liberation, not just sort of spiritual liberation, but actual sort of real concrete material liberation. Mm -hmm. No, Cohn's controversial, but intentionally provocative phrase that God is black, that Jesus is black is um, really rooted in the scriptures. It's rooted in, God taking sides with the Israelites and liberating them from slavery uh, out of Egypt. And so I think the white the theological approach that just assumes God is neutral in struggles, uh, political struggles and social struggles, wouldn't be able to create the conditions for the Exodus story at all, which is really the heart of the Jewish faith. The, the heart of the Hebrew scriptures is Exodus, is the Exodus event. And so that event... Um, where God took sides with Israel is where he necessarily takes sides against Egypt. The idea that a the whiteness of God would be so general that God doesn't take sides wouldn't allow for a situation like that. Within the Jews' face where God has his particular people that he um, sides with and fights for, fights on behalf of, you see that all throughout the Psalms, um, is really something that gets flattened out with 
white theology that refuses to contextualize everything that just is so generic and universalized where yep. uh, even in situations of injustice, it, it, it can look at a situation of injustice and say, no, we just we preach the gospel alike to both the oppressor and the oppressed. But that's not what the Bible does. The Bible does not speak the uh, message of God, does not does not speak to the oppressed in the same way that God speaks to the oppressor. Failing to recognize kind of those social dynamics is, I think, a chief uh, fault of some of the uh, problems within white theology that Cohn um, demonstrates and recognizes. The Exodus and all that kind of then moves way into Christ and um, him being then the fulfillment of the liberation of God's liberation of Israel. Um, I've been talking a little bit more on my channel. I did a video on the political dimension of the cross being a political execution, um, how it's not just some right. spiritual event, uh, right. that Rome did not make a habit of crucifying people who claimed to be the Messiah. There were other people in that time period that claimed to be the Messiah that were not crucified by Rome. It was only because of the social and political um, rebellion, potentially, that was being brewed through Christ's words and teaching that would have led to him being made an example of through the execution on the cross. Um, and so, yeah, this this dimension is really important where God takes sides with the poor and oppressed in history. Cohn kind of takes that into uh, consideration when he talks about the blackness of God, that God is black. Uh, is essentially the same thing as saying that Jesus was a Jew uh, yep. in occupied yeah. Israel in uh, mm -hmm. under Roman Roman un, under the Roman Empire. I make the point frequently throughout the book that God did not incarnate into Herod's courts and privilege and wealth. God incarnated in Bethlehem and and in a stable or cave, whatever it actually was, and in the in the poverty who lived most of his life uh, homeless and dependent on others uh not most of his life the, the years of his ministry we just totally miss all of these important themes of the scriptures themselves when we flatten out the gospel to just be all oh, god loves everybody you have to pray this prayer yeah <laughs> and that's kind of it and yeah. it doesn't say anything to the political forms of oppression and the systemic forms of an injustice and it says nothing to actually help the oppressed and i think that was cone's really big insight that he realized all of this white theology it didn't mean anything to my black community that was still struggling under the the effects of systemic racism who who even to this day the black community is being killed by the idols of white supremacy in the yep. church will ref is still refusing to call that out and to reject white supremacy some some parts of the church are aligning with it and that failure to call it out is for cone rightly so complicity your silence in the face of injustice is still complicity to it because you're allowing it to go on unchallenged. And so the complete bankruptcy of that spiritually, but also politically for the white church to just be totally silent when, you know, in Buffalo, uh, a white supremacist buys a gun and goes to a historically black neighborhood to kill black people. Yeah. Clearly inspired by white supremacy. And, you know, I think people... I, in the white church, church especially, it, Martin Luther King becomes thrown around as like, oh, no, we just have to make peace and, you know, all of this. But Cone makes a good point that King was also hated during his lifetime and he's been whitewashed. Um, Cornell West has a great book where he brings out the radical King. And so he yeah. tried to show that King is not this whitewashed, you know, just all oh, just everybody kumbaya. He was very much hated during his time. And Cohn's own study of King and uh, Malcolm X is excellent. You can see the influence of both on Cohn's own thinking, particularly Malcolm X a little bit more in terms of how Cohn understands violence. Um, so there's a lot there. It's heavy stuff. I, I, I think as a white man, it's hard to talk about it without getting um, feeling like I'm kind of over my head because it's something that I, I think when I started to read Cone, I didn't really understand the depths of my ignorance about all the ways the white church had failed. And I think after I read Cone and went back, think, thought through my past, I, I don't remember a single sermon in my life that called out mm -hmm. racism. I don't remember a single sermon that had anything positive to say about uh, about the struggle for black liberation or black justice. Um, we talked hours and hours about all oh, sexual sin or porn or whatever else but we never called out white supremacy uh we never called out injustice and you know my church was really white there was maybe yeah. one you know mixed family and that was about it um in a rural part of ohio and it, it, it's something that i think 
I, I can't see the gospel any other way now because I, I think I'm very thankful for Cohn and really many other liberation theologians after him. And really Maltman and a lot of these others really s emphasize the political dimension of the gospel. The blackness of God is essentially the statement that God is the God of the oppressed, that he takes sides in situations of injustice with those who are victims of, of oppression. And he does so in the same way that he was on the sides of the Israelites in order to liberate them from that captivity. You know, as Jesus says in Luke 4, came to liberate the captives, free the oppressed, proclaim good news to the poor. You know, that that's something that's just totally overlooked in evangelicalism and white theology. And I, and I think a lot of it is because we are aware that we're complicit in it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, like Cohn mm -hmm. said, the why is he letting his theological imagination be stimulated by people who enslaved his grandparents? You know, why are we spending all of our time focusing on, you know, these people that were complicit in, in injustice? One of the things I remember from, from Cohen that really struck me is that he wrote black theology for his black community, but in some sense, it's also against the white community in a challenging yeah. way, yeah. in that prophetic yeah. kind of tear down the wall <clears throat> sort of way. Um, not in an outlet, right, like rejection or, or whatever, but in the sense where challenge to do better, challenge to see the struggle. And, and really that comes into his ethics where he, he calls the challenge to become black with Christ is a challenge that he puts up almost in a sense of uh, repentance. That's his kind of phrase for repentance of, of becoming black with Christ in a, in a way of siding with the oppressed, taking up the struggle with the oppressed against the oppressor. I think it's just such a heavy thing that weighs on me a lot. And I think more and more of the Plain English series books, this is kind of a little bit more of where I'm at now in terms of where I see my own thinking moved towards um, sure. because of Cone. And so he's made a huge yeah. impact on me of always remembering as much as I can geek out about Schleiermacher that if it doesn't have real grounds in the struggle for the oppressed, then it's probably not worth the paper it's written on. I can tell that, that this is, has been and is impactful on your on your thinking, and that's that's really awesome. Cohen has has been so important to me, and a lot of you know liberation theologians as well. An important kind of takeaway for me mm -hmm. from these thinkers and all of their different diversities and particularities, because they are doing very specific and important things from their own locations, mm -hmm. is that if the gospel has no material impact it's no gospel mm. at all. Like it, yeah. it just can't be. <laughs> if it yeah. doesn't address something to do with the realities that we're in here and now mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. embodied people, then it just yeah. can't be the truth. And I, I, I wish that wasn't controversial, <laughs> Yeah. but unfortunately it is Yeah. Um, for a lot of people. But to me, it's unavoidable, especially, mm -hmm. you know, um, from the gospels in particular, and the, especially, you know, Luke's gospel being mm -hmm. sort of uh, really geared toward the poor and um, yeah. the oppressed and honestly kind of anti-rich. And yeah. uh, that can be muted a lot of the time, but I think it's just there. And I, yeah. I, I think we need to take that seriously, that if, if the gospel isn't materially yeah. impactful and, and isn't materially liberative for real people here yeah. and now, then we, we should abandon that mm -hmm. it's almost like returning to that torrance phrase if it just happens behind our head or over our back in some sort of empty exchange yeah. and it doesn't really affect real people then it's just it's an yeah. empty gospel it doesn't it's just a transaction that you know yeah i checked the box i've said the prayer i'm saved you know yeah. to avoid wrath or, or whatever and it's not something that actually impacts people um where they are and i i was actually just reading and did some writing about this today so i have i have the quote pulled up but um a theologian from the 20th century named jan lockman uh says this that just captures it really oh, well yeah. he says uh to follow this gospel command of jesus to love our neighbor is to ask about a real person and that question concerns the actual conditions under which that real person in a real community is required to live it gets to really the heart of what that we're talking about it yeah we're, yeah we're called to love our neighbor if that's the gospel why does it just become abstract and spiritualized? Why doesn't it have to, why don't we start asking questions about the real conditions of people uh, in their struggles, both materially, politically, spiritually, uh, socially play these just kind of empty abstract games uh, instead. Yeah. Yeah. That really encapsulates a lot of what we've been talking about. Thank you for, for reading that. And I'm, I'm glad, uh, glad to hear you've been writing about 
uh, stuff to do with that recently. Um, yeah, sure. which is a good segue into <laughs> what you have coming up, or at least sort of thinking about um, yeah. in terms of more plain English books. Um, so, who mm -hmm. are some of the figures that you were thinking about um, writing mm -hmm. about going forward for this series? Yeah. Um, so the, the next two for sure will be Paul Tillich, uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and then potentially Boltman, Kierkegaard, a few others. Um, but definitely Tillich and uh, Bonhoeffer in that order will be the next Ooh. two for the Plain English series. Um, though I've kind of put both, I've kind of put the series on pause for a little bit um, because I think because of Cone's impact and for other reasons, I um, have two books. Originally it was going to be one, but two books that I'm working on right now of political theology, kind of a lot awesome. of the stuff I'm talking about. Um, so the one I'm working on now that may come, I have one that's going to be kind of a doorstopper, which I'm excited about um, that particularly engages with the question of socialism in the church. Um, that's going cool. to be the bigger book. I'll do that. Um, I'm hoping next year that one comes out. Hopefully Great. this year I've done a shorter book that ties into that one. Um, that's a study of the early church fathers and their um, approach to riches, poverty, economic justice. And um, there's so much there too. Yeah. That's where so that quote comes from. Us, yeah. From yeah. that. Um, mm -hmm. And so those are the two I'm kind of focusing on now uh, in terms of theology. And so once those are done, I will move back and look at Tillich. Um, I think Tillich's a good returning point to the series. I, I am really excited to dive back into the plain English series, but I just feel it's, um, you know, through Cone, very necessary to get out some some good stuff about um, all these big questions, uh, wealth, poverty, I I injustice. And um, so look out for those. Those two will be coming out. Like I said, one this year, awesome. uh, the bigger one, hopefully next year. We'll see. It's quite a mammoth mammoth topic. Uh, so I'm trying to trying to do that one really well. Um, so those two, the moment, a short novel as well. So that may be another one in between, but we'll see. <laughs> Great. So. Yeah. All this stuff is really exciting, Stephen. Um, yeah. it, it's been awesome to to have talked to you. Um, yeah, likewise. For, for this interview and also our previous one, um, it really excited to see um, what you put out. And it sounds like the topics that you're engaging with are extremely important um, yeah, I think for so. really the life of the church, I think. And yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're doing it. Looking forward to seeing these things come to to fruition for you yeah um anything you want to plug before we uh log off i know you have a youtube channel yeah but... yeah since we're on the platform i'll yeah, sure of course plug youtube by mostly a writer but you know youtube's i found myself i don't know if your experience with youtube's the same but found so many people learn through youtube so i'm like i might as well start investing some in that so yeah do mm -hmm. youtube now um but like I say, expect this year for a, a book uh, or two from me about awesome. um, either the church fathers or, or other stuff. So, um, but yeah, can always check out the other volumes of the planning series. If anybody um, piqued your interest uh, throughout those five theologians, you can check them out, but I really appreciate your time and having me on. This was a ton of fun. I, I really had a good time. Yeah, you bet. No, it, it was, yeah, my pleasure. This was really, really fun. Thank you, Stephen. Um, for being yeah. here and uh, thank you all for watching this video whenever you do um, mm -hmm. and for supporting this channel and I want to thank especially um, our patrons on on Patreon who have been um, particularly supportive of this channel and if, if you haven't gone to look at our, our Patreon patreon.com slash apocalypse here um, to see some of the benefits on that that channel and if you feel you know called to to support us in that way that would be great um, if not you can subscribe to the channel. You can leave a like, leave a comment. All of those things are really, really helpful um, to support us as well. And with that, this has been Apocalypse Here. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.